What I'd like to do is talk about uh, pulsar perimetry, which is a uh, new procedure that is avail available on the Octopus 600. And there have been a number of different tests. I've been involved in many of these, um, standard white-on-white -white perimetry, short wavelength perimetry, and flicker perimetry. And pulsar perimetry is a new type of procedure that has spatial and temporal uh, characteristics that cause a uh, flickering type of target, as you see on, on the slide here. And uh, in addition, it, there is a motion component. You can probably see the centrifugal motion uh, that is present as well, and I think that's a very uh, nice feature of it. Um, there are um, images that occur. This is uh, the two different phases where the center is dark and light and, and such. And the way in which this stimulus is presented is that there's uh, an attenuation of the contrast uh, as you go from the center out to the periphery, and you can see that very nicely in this slide um, that is presented here. It uh, basically combines uh, contrast of the target, the light and dark uh, portions, with also uh, spatial and temporal changes that occur and uses the technique that combines the uh, spatial arrangement and the uh, temporal characteristics that are there we are that are present there to present testing um, of this to evaluate for a number of different contrast levels and spatial and temporal frequencies in an efficient manner. This is the pulsar uh, perimeter, and as you can see, it is quite uh, uh, compact in size, and it's got uh, very nice operation, and uh, we have one of the Octopus 600s uh, with pulsar perimetry that uh, we are currently doing uh, some evaluations with. It's got a uh, very unique design, and it uses uh, tendency-oriented perimetry, the top strategy, to perform the threshold testing and uh, determines the characteristics of that. And it doesn't require that you have any particular lighting characteristics. You don't have to have a completely darkened room or anything. And one of the things we were interested in, I'd like to present some findings with pulsar perimetry because we had a, an earlier version before it got implemented in the Octopus 600. And I was interested in a, a few things that um, were um, uh, good considerations for clinical use. One is how reliable is the calibration of it and how good is it there and also how robust is it to the nuances that would occur in a clinic. When you have a laboratory setting and you put some, something in the laboratory, it always works best for the person that developed the device. But when you have people using it throughout the world in a number of different clinics, there are quite a wide variety of, very, of uh, changes that can occur. And so we were interested in looking at how robust uh, this is and uh, whether it's an appropriate device. So we did calibration of the monitor, and I show the stability of the background. Uh, as you can see, this is the pulsar stimulus here. This is a, um, essentially a, a calibration of the uh, monitor over time. We went to um, about an hour and a half to look at this. We also looked from day to day, and it's quite stable. The first couple of minutes, there is a small variation, but it's a rather minimal amount. It's, it's less than 10% that occurs um, that is present there. But within a few minutes, it's very, very stable. And I think that's a very good characteristic. I was also interested in how well it felt, uh, how well it uh, conformed to that uh, configuration that was shown on a previous slide. And so we measured with a photometer and a radiometer um, the characteristics of that, and um, that was also quite reliable. So I think that was uh, very useful as well. Here is a, some examples that we have of a multi-center trial that we did with a group in Argentina, a group in Italy, and a group in Portland, Oregon, 
um, for evaluating this. And this compared to the um, Humphrey 30-2. And as you can see, this is someone with an inferior partial arcuate <laughs> defect and nasal step and good reproducibility for the pulsar perimeter um, that was shown for the Humphrey. Here's another example of an inferior paracentral type defect that is depicted quite well, and it shows up more prominently on the pulsar perimeter than on the Humphrey field analyzer. And then a third example, which shows a superior nasal step that is present, and again, it looks a bit more prominent on the pulsar perimeter, so I think that this was promising. But this is just some examples to show you individual examples. And one of the things we were interested in was how robust is it for evaluation clinically. So one of the things that we looked at was um, uh, how well does it respond to variations if you have changes in refractive error. And we blurred up to um, six diopters and found that it was only when you got beyond about three diopters of refractive error that you started getting differences, as you can see in that uh, top left slide. Pupil size, we varied pupil size by putting apertures in front of the eye uh, of various diameters. And you can see with one, two, three, and four millimeter uh, pupil sizes that we had there that there was um, very little variation in this. So I think that was robust as well. Another thing that is an issue is the background adaptation level. And so we used some filters to change the adaptation level. And at least for the standard operating conditions, one can have a tenfold change in the background adaptation level with minimal effects. But as you can see in the lower left slide, that once you get down to very low levels, where it's mesopic or scotopic uh, areas, you do get changes and a reduction in the sensitivity. So it, it uh, has some range where you will keep stable responses. And we also looked at the reliability, false positives, false negatives, and such. And uh, this is with the old pulsar perimeter, room, el room illumination. If you had the lights on, that violates the calibration of the old device, and the Octopus 600 may operate a little bit differently, but uh, that gave a lot of variation. So it's, it's really important to use standardized conditions, but I think this was all very favorable in terms of uh, its performance and its resistance to things that can affect results clinically. We then compared it to frequency doubling, or the matrix, and also some structural characteristics, and these are ROC curves where you look at sensitivity and specificity. And just to give a summary of this, it performed essentially quite well, and at least as well as the Humphrey matrix um, uh, frequency doubling perimeter, possibly a little bit better, but it had very good performance when you looked at um, glaucoma patients, a group of normals, a group of uh, ocular hypertensives, and a group with glaucomatous optic neuropathy, but normal visual fields for standard white-on-white uh, uh, -white perimetry for that. And it did perform quite well, at least as well as frequency doubling, and possibly a little bit better. But as you can see, there was a lot of overlap there. But notice that the frequency doubling and the pulsar show very similar results for that, and there's a lot of overlap. And I think that uh, one of the advantages is the motion component actually gives people a better idea of when they can see the stimulus and when they can't. So I think that's a big advantage as well. We also looked at test-retest variability on a number of different characteristics and the effects of test duration, and the te there is really not much of a learning effect or practice effect that occurs with uh, pulsar perimetry. And the test duration, uh, even for different groups, the controls, the ocular hypertensions, glaucomatous optic neuropathy, and uh, primary open angle glaucoma, does not vary too much. The sensitivity, obviously, is worse overall for the glaucomas, and the variability increases a bit. But I think that was also quite promising. Looking at different age groups, 
Older individuals take a little bit longer and they have reduced sensitivity compared to uh, individuals that are younger. And the test duration was, was longer. Um, and looking at the different groups, you can see that there's very similar types of results that are present there. And um, again, dividing that into different age groups, that's fine. And we looked at also the areas that um, there was good correlation and poor correlation for this and the res uh, relationship with uh, other characteristics. But I think overall, we really had very promising results. I think this is a new technology that's quite um, desirable. And we are now developing a normative database for the Octopus 600 with multiple centers. And we're going to be comparing that to standard automated perimetry and pulsar perimetry. And I think the nice thing is that the Octopus 600 has all the features of the Octopus 900 plus pulsar perimetry. And I think this is a very uh, useful approach. So with that, I will thank you for your attention, and I will open it up for questions that you may have. Yes. The glaucoma world talks about pre-parametric glaucoma, apparently because we have to have a significant number of ganglion cells that are, you know, that are gone before we'll actually pick it up. That is maybe with standard Zeiss perimetry. So uh, do I get the sense from you that this is more sensitive and we're going to redefine pre-parametric glaucoma to really parametric glaucoma? <laughs> I think that's a good sort of thing. This, this has been a label and I think that's sort of dogma is pre-parametric glaucoma. More often than not you can see structural changes before you can notice functional changes but the reverse occurs as well. And I don't have it on my slide, but I have an example of someone with uh, about a 0.2 cup, perfectly healthy opt uh, optic nerve with stereo photography, um, doing imaging with uh, HRT and OCT, also within normal limits. But the person on three different forms of perimetry had an inferior arcuate defect. So that does occur as well. And I, I kind of cringe when I hear people saying pre-parametric glaucoma because I think you have to look at both structure and function. And I don't think that one always precedes the other. And the fact that uh, structural changes are more noticeable means we've got to do a better job. And I think that this is something that uh, is promising with Pulsar because it does seem to be giving very good results even in people who have a normal standard visual field but who have evidence of structural damage. Thank you. Um, how does this new technology perform in other types of visual field effects, not just glaucoma? Well, I can't speak specifically for Pulsar, but I must say that the t spatial and temporal characteristics are very similar to uh, frequency doubling. We have looked at macular disease, retinal disease, um, pre-chiasmal, post-chiasmal, and glaucomatous characteristics and other optic neuropathies. And I would say that for, for frequency doubling, it actually does better than standard perimetry in the neuro-ophthalmologic conditions, other optic neuropathies, and pre- and post-chiasmal deficits and it seems also effective for macular disease. So I would imagine that Pulsar will also perform quite well. And it may be better because it's got that motion component. Yeah, I, I'm curious about uh, the subjects who have had the opportunity to do these visual fields with the motion component. Have they found that to be easier? As I was looking to the mean uh, times that you had for the duration mm -hmm. of the test, it looked a lot less than what I usually see <laughs> when I'm looking at the visual field test in my office. And I wonder whether it may be easier for some of our elderly patients to uh, do that and more facile time-wise as well. Has that turned out to be the case? I, I think that's also the case. And I would imagine for uh, neurologic patients with cognitive impairment or with attentional deficits and children that it would also be quite useful because it's a very, motion is a very compelling stimulus. So I, I suspect, you know, we, all, we have to do the studies. I'm, I'm an evidence-based person. And we need to do the studies to, uh, to verify that, but I think 
the outcome looks promising, quite promising. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we had one more question from the audience over here. I was just curious, on your Humphrey slides, mm -hmm. where you did the Humphrey comparison to the Pulsar, mm -hmm. what strategy was used with that? Uh, CETA standard. CETA standard, thank yes. you. Yes. OK, great. Thank you so much. That, that's wonderful. I, I think we're going to switch gears ever so uh, slightly. And I'm going to thank you.